A thought that came into my brain, and I think about this with my students, what is the prime directive of life? What must all life do? What is the single job that all life has? And the answer is, we are working every day. This is good for you, fine things will come your way, all is aching, back is sore, this is no problems, because you're building character, thank you please, no more character. It's our turn to dance, our turn to sing, our turn to turn the world around to give the best of everything. No looking back, this is our chance, our turn to sing, our turn to Much youth, so few brains, how am I still alive? Darkly praying to the light, the tingling begins. Believing in the gospel of the state that I was in. It was our turn to dance, our turn to sing, our turn to turn the world around. To give the best of everything, no looking back. This is our chance, our turn to sing, our turn to dance. We thought it was an appropriate and tantalizing way to begin the episode with an unfinished quote from Livingston Taylor. You'll have to listen to the whole episode to hear the answer. Hi, it's Chuck from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. Boston's own Livingston Taylor is a musician, teacher, and interested man. Yes, I said interested, not interesting. Not that Livingston isn't interesting, because he certainly is. This will all make sense in our conversation. Liv is a full professor at Berklee College of Music, where he teaches stage performance. He's currently celebrating a 50-plus year career with a brand new album called The Best of Liv, 50 Years of Livingston Taylor Live. This album has 11 tracks from his upcoming box set of the same name, featuring unreleased live performances spanning his career from 1969 through 2016. There's also a fantastic documentary called Livingston Taylor, Life is Good, that won the Van Gogh Award for the Feature Documentary category at the Amsterdam International Film Festival, and you can check that out on Amazon. Livingston has played with Joni Mitchell, Linda Ronstadt, Fleetwood Mac, Jimmy Buffett, and Jethro Tull, to name just a few, and he continues to play and tour internationally. We actually met Liv briefly at the Recovery Fest Music Festival this past summer, and he opens and closes our music addiction and recovery episode for us. You should listen to that special episode when you get the chance. Liv flew in from Martha's Vineyard, and I mean he actually flew himself in as he is an instrument-rated pilot, to have a truly great conversation in his Watertown offices with us. We talked about teaching, performance, learning, and even about steel manufacturing. He is a man who has an insatiable thirst for being interested, and he will tell you without asking that he loves you, and he means it. So here is our conversation with the amazing Livingston Taylor recorded in his office in Watertown, Massachusetts. I don't know if you remember I followed you. He does remember. In Rhode Island. Yes. And the last time I heard you tuning your guitar was right there uh, backstage behind Recovery Fest in front of 12,500 people. So thank you for doing this and thank you for playing for that whole group. For the episode, I don't know if you heard it, you lead off and you close the episode. You were so happy to see all the smiling faces out there. It was really uplifting beginning to the episode, Mm, which can be, you know, it was was an interesting episode for us because of... Just the day, it being a first-time sober festival, and we met a lot of people in recovery, some people who were just two days in recovery to years in recovery. It was just a really joyful day, I thought. Yeah, it was a, it was a really 
wonderful event. I agree with that. So, you know, and you also, you played at Cary Hall in Lexington a couple years ago. Yes. And we were there. And our good friend, who's also in our band, David Moore, opened for you. Yes, that's right. As I yeah, so that was a very, he was very excited about that. Mm-hmm. And he actually, didn't that open up Cary Hall? Wasn't that the first performance there? I don't recall whether that I was thought it was, because it just uh, recently opened. Anyway, it, it, was was it was one of the first ones. Yeah, brand yeah. newly renovated. Yes, newly renovated. Well, and I remember the second set came on, and I had not known, I guess I knew that you played other instruments besides the guitar. I was not prepared for the grand piano. The way that you interacted with the audience was very different than on guitar. Hmm. And I interesting. It, you took on sort of a different a different role almost. Yeah. And then uh, and then you went back to guitar. The piano is a really important instrument. The piano is the language that everything is written in. And so you need a key, some keyboard skills to solve problems to do charts there there are lots of things that pianos allow you to do and in your case it was a, a little more than basic skills obviously you've done this for a few years yeah but the percussive nature and the yeah. accompanying the the story yeah was palpable yeah and I, I enjoyed yeah. that well like uh, thank you and I really like the idea I work very hard on keyboard and getting it to improve they require lots of work I ask you once, I ask you twice Where is your heart this morning? I need to know Is there a chance you see The place where I see you I see you here Beside me I miss your laughter This place after you have gone, it's so old and blue. I ask you once, I ask you twice, do you think I still miss you? Is there anything I wouldn't do to touch your face again? I need to know What stood out to me that was something that obviously stood out to you in 1969 when you opened for somebody, Joni Mitchell. Yes. That's a few years ago, but I thought what was really powerful was not just that you were double-billed with this emerging star. Your comment was, they liked me. This works with the audience. I think I can do this now. Yeah. The sense of the success of that night was that this is functional. I built the car. uh, We took it for a test drive. And it works. And uh, now we can do other things with it. Hmm. But it, it clearly had to work in front of an audience to have it be viable. It did. And uh, knock on wood, it seems to have continued. So that's good news. Same car, multiple oil changes. <laughs> well, we've changed the oil a few times. <laughs> you know, so I saw the, uh, the documentary. Yeah. And it was great. Especially great. when we see people that we know and have already talked to. Yeah. And there we talked to Roger already. Mm-hmm. And we talked to Sally, of course. Yeah. But you said something that echoes something my dad says all the time. You are interesting if you are interested. And actually, you said something. I'm not interested in you if you're interesting. Yeah. I'm interested in you if you're interested. Do you remember well, saying that? I, 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 do, I do say that. And that's because parents drop off kids to me. And the parents are panicky that their children are interesting and they've dipped them in all these marinades to make them interesting and when they drop them off at me the desperation is that this creature that they love so much will be interesting will be able to add value and they really don't understand that in that parental desperation they don't understand that what we need people to be is interested not interesting and so the question is, how do you make interesting people interested? And it is really hard. When do you see that transition in if you see it. a kid that comes to mind? How do you I, see it? I don't know, and I don't know how I see it. I'll walk into class, start of a semester, and I'll look out over my students, and there are a couple in there generally out of 40 students, there will be three or four that are really locked in, be asking the question, what am I doing here? 
What information am I going to get? I need information. What am I going to get from this guy? Other than that, I shouldn't be wasting my time. And I like that student. I like that tough kid a lot. Well, a lot of times they don't, they've never had a class like this before. They've gone, they've taken their lessons, they've been in, you know, the chorus or some, or the high school band, but you're challenging them individually, which can be honestly terrifying. It can be terrifying to someone, especially a young kid. I mean, I went to Berkeley for a very short period of time. I knew I wasn't made for it. it just, you have to live, breathe, eat it. You have to, it has to be, I wasn't interesting or interested. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, you were too young. You know, right that's, now you're very interesting. Well, I have th- to tell you. I'm interested. I'm interested I'm in you. Interesting. I'm interested. It's something that when you throw the light back on themselves and rather than them trying to put something out there, you throw the light back on themselves while they're on stage, which I think is I mean, I was watching that documentary, and I could feel it in the pit of my stomach. I got nervous for them I, you, as you were instructing them and and uh, talking with them. And it was all very positive reinforcement, but still, it's a little scary. Hmm. It isn't designed to be scary, yeah, but it I know is. That, but... but these are people who are paying real money to be there. And it is my belief that if they are paying money, my responsibility is to add value to who and what they are. My personal equation on this is I expect what they learn from me. I need the cost of the course to be returned 100 times by the time they're 60. So from 20, 30, 40, 50, in in that 40 Mm. years, if they've paid 2,000 for the course, Mm. I need them to make 200,000, 100 times what they've paid for that. And that's just some arbitrary figure I make, but I take it very seriously. Well, it's not just money. It's what you give back to what you've learned, to take the tools and to do something with it. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but no, no, it is about the money. I, I, I mean, that's... Um, but it's art, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You have to define what money is. Yeah. And what money is, is a mutually agreed on repository of value. So if I do a great show and four people want to invite me for breakfast tomorrow morning as compensation for what they received from me, I can only use one breakfast. So I'll take one breakfast and then the others can give me $4 a piece. Uh, so I walk out with breakfast and $12. So, so that's what we use money for. Money is simply a repository of value. And I explain to my students that above all else, what I want them to be is happy. But if they can't be happy, I want them to be rich. (laughs) Under no circumstance do I want them poor and miserable. I assure them that their parents agree with me. And I don't think you get to mix it up. I don't think you take their money and then say, well, I'm not, I'm giving you some vague sort of, oh, you're making art and that. No, you got to create value off of what you've learned. So that's the interesting pressure of someone in this field. It's an amazing challenge because what you're mentioning about being on stage and having fear and knowing that what you're doing is being critiqued in a a, a structured way, you know that you're going to be working in this field, needing to pay the bills, needing to pay the mortgage, of course. But at the same time, when you're 20, or when you're 18, and you've given yourself to music, you know, I've been a songwriter since I was 12. There's something about losing that guard where you have to say, this music is in my soul, but it can be, it can be improved upon to make money. Does that make well, sense? No, it can be improved upon to be of more service. And money fairly earned indicates that you've provided service, that you have been of service. You come to the Berkeley College of Music or you go to medical school and you got to pay them. Somebody says to you, we have fixed costs. If you want to come here and get the badge we have to present, then you need to pay us to do that. Or somebody needs to pay us. So we charge students money and then it comes back, well, we're giving you tools to live life, to spread. No, 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 no. That's liberal arts. Yeah. That was Uh, was my undergrad in anthropology. That's fine. (laughs) 
But when you graduated in anthropology, your debt load is nowhere near what these students are taking on for a debt load now. I take this stuff very, very seriously. Yeah. In some ways, if, if your students understand that, that that's a foundation for how you feel, that must be helpful for them that they realize that this is my life. Well, I got to be practical And about the this. reason why you're going to make a living is because you are adding value to people. You go on stage and you play a song and it's clear enough, it's concise enough, it's sharp, it's focused. It teaches people and people take away from your creative conceptualization It improves the quality of their life, and as a result, they pay you for it. They pay you for that service. Also, I say to my students that they need to be very mindful about understanding what they're adding to a corporate structure that they're affiliated with. I assure you, if you're not keeping track, somebody is. And if you cost more money than you bring in, you're going to be fired. What do you find is the is the most difficult thing? Well, what is it that you have to feel like you have to dissuade your students of any kind of preconceived idea of what they're... The thing that's most difficult to get out of their brains is that this isn't about them. I don't care that it has your name on the marquee, that it has your name on the record, that it has your name on the download. Who is important are the consumers of this and are they being improved by your creative vision? And how can you make it more palatable, more fulfilling? How can you make it help others? I'll ask my students, do you ever videotape yourselves? And they all confess that they do. Mm -hmm. And I say, and then who looks at that videotape? Mm -hmm. Well, we do. And I say, why would you do that? If you want to videotape something, film your audience listening to you. How are they doing in the presence of your vision? Students who come into my class, I explain to them that they knew that the people who loved them knew their name before they knew their name. Their teachers know their name. They don't know how to say their names. They don't know how to say who I am. And the notion of standing on stage, can you imagine the hubris and the arrogance of standing up on a stage and saying to a group of people, I want you to stop what you're doing and I want you to pay attention to my conceptualization, to my visions. This is a stunningly bold act. And this is, of course, why people get nervous. You become fearful that your vision will not justify the interruption in other people's lives. And I say to my students about nervousness, you're nervous, get over it. Because when you are nervous, you are thinking about yourself. And they are paying you to think about them, not you. So sharpen up. And invariably things are sloppy. The chords are sloppy. The words are sloppy. The melodies are indefinite. And the reason why is that the gatekeepers who would have, in my day, enforced accuracy and clarity, they're eviscerated. They're all gone. I can right now pull out my cell phone. I can record a piece of material. I can post it. And it is available probably for somewhere around three or four billion people on the planet. Now, three or four billion aren't going to hear it. And the reason why is that it's not very good. So all of a sudden you get a feedback because you you can expose it to three billion people. You get four people who say it's good. Four people who don't know anything tell you it's good and you actually believe this is good. This isn't how you have a career. You've been doing this since 89 at Berkeley, is that right? Yes. 30 years now, 29, 30 years has been quite a technological change for everyone in every field. But the problem with it is what we lost were the gatekeepers. So when I was recording, I talked somebody who had a recording studio into recording me, into making that investment in me. Then I put out a demo record and somebody else said, well, I like this. Let's go a little further with it. At which point I was signed in my first record contract to a guy named Phil Walden at Capricorn Records down in Macon, Georgia. So I was 19. 
my producer, a guy named John Landau, mm -hmm. and John would have been 22 or so, and then Phil Walden, head of the record company, would have been 30-ish. But then the record was distributed by Atco Atlantic. Now you have Jerry Wexler, Amit Erdogan. These are old men at this point. And it goes up through that chain. Now, was Ahmed Erdogan listening to what Livingston Taylor as a 19-year-old was doing? No. But eventually, he'd be reading a sales report. And he'd go, um, I see we're getting a little buzz off this Livingston Taylor. What is he doing? Uh, it's got a little pop to it. Let me hear it. Let me listen. What do you think? I think it's good. I think we should put Livingston with a... Uh, I've got a producer out of New York that I think makes sense for him. And I think we've gotten a little buzz here, and I think if we accentuate this a little bit, we might get, uh, might get a little more airplay. This is good. This is a good foundation. Let's invest more money. Book editors. You don't need a book editor. You don't need a book publisher you to say publish to you, uh, you bring the manuscript to, and they say, this isn't any good. Right. I'm not going to put it out. At which point you go, no problem. I'll do it myself. Right. So Neil Young's song, Oh man, look at my life. I'm a lot like you were. There's sort of a banjo in that. Would you like to know who's playing that banjo? James Taylor. Hmm. They were concentrated in Southern California. It wasn't actually a banjo. It was a guitar banjo. And James put that part on. James is a great guitar player. Hmm. And on this, he adds that part. It's a big record. But somebody concentrated those people together. That didn't come out of nowhere. Somebody had an ear had an eye, had a feel, and brought them together. There's a festival today. Come and see, it's all so fine. People who could not my kind are here. I'm always caught in this in my life. Maybe I'm kind of coming to terms with it more recently since I'm a little older. But the idea that it takes years to, you know, that whole 10,000 to get hours. to oh, hours. Yeah, yeah. 10,000 hours. Does, does that idea, it's a hard idea to swallow anyways, as, as a, just a general person, I think. But I've become more patient with things that I do, and I don't worry about the instant gratification. Have you seen that change? Especially because with the instant gratification of getting things you write it, it's online, it's automatically on YouTube. Do you find the kids anticipate that and want that and you have to dissuade them of that? Or are they a little bit more deep than I, than I um, think? There's a lyric I wrote a couple of years ago, a real favorite lyric of mine. And the lyric says, end of July, the old Russian river is low and lazy and moseys along. The girls from the outside paddle by slowly, wearing nothing but smiles. Now the peaceful is gone. So we suck in our bellies and slick back our hair and strain for a look and remember back when we would fight to the death for a moment of notice. Then the girls disappear round the bend and we sigh and we smile 
and sing out again. Bohemia, hey, it's a... But that notion, there's a time when you will fight to the death for a moment of notice. And that's something that naturally dissipates as you get older. Yes, you are able to have more patience. This is why gatekeepers are so important to throttle down your desire to post instantly something you just did, which doesn't deserve posting yet. And I'll say that to my students, who here has posted something that two weeks later, they wish they had waited because it got better. Some of the gatekeepers in the 60s and 70s were that human version of that, to put the stop, to say, wait a second, let's... Let's well, there were gatekeepers in. everywhere. So here are the eagles starting out. They've got a buzz. And now you can assemble around them a great graphic designer, terrific recording studios, excellent engineers, an unbelievable mixer, a pressing plant that really knows what they're doing, a graphic design artist, tour support, all of this endless mm-hmm. sea of competence that nobody can have alone. That's a true team. That is a true team. Great art is the result of wealth concentrating talent. Well, you know what's interesting to me, it always is, is that no matter the technology, no matter what we've been talking about for the last several minutes about how things have changed uh, with the internet and the instant gratification, you can't fake a good song, right? Well, first off, good songs, they can be difficult to define. For example... I really like Taylor Swift. Now, why do I like Taylor Swift? I like Taylor Swift because I like the way she looks and I admire her tenacity and what she's been able to do and I understand viscerally how difficult it is for her to be in the position that she is in and she's able to endure it. So there are lots of things I like about her. But if you pull her lyrics out... This isn't great lyric writing. These are songs that come in with lots of other infrastructure that's helping them out. The brand is Taylor Swift. The songs are a soundtrack for her brand. By the way, I was watching the Super Bowl last evening. Yeah. And Maroon 5 comes on with, uh, what's his name? The Adam Levine. Adam Levine. Yeah, California. And God, and he was so insecure about his content that he actually had to take off his shirt. It broke my heart. Adam Levine didn't believe that his music was enough. So after I watched Adam Levine, believe me, I cooked up Stevie Wonder at the Super Bowl. Stevie Wonder didn't need to take off his shirt with the name California tattooed on his ripping abs and the reason why is he was singing you can feel it all over you can feel it all over people and the place went crazy and he was in such a state of joy bruno mars a couple of years ago with the super bowl He didn't have to take off his shirt because he was dancing and he was joyous. And by the way, these are some good songs. And the only person who doesn't believe they're good enough is Is Adam Adam. Levine. Don't you, can't you see that? So I was watching that and I actually, I was amazed with how many hits they've had over 20 years. These are great songs. Yes, and... That's the irony here. And what the irony is that it wasn't enough. He didn't believe that he would be enough. And the desperation and the fear was palatable. Do you think part of it is because of the machine of the Super Bowl and like they have to do something bigger and more to talk about? I don't know what the machine is. No, I think without gatekeepers around, insecure, Desperate people are the only people who rise up. Do you think it's by, uh, by accident that Donald Trump gets to be president of the United States? A man who is so insecure, so fearful that he has to do ridiculous things all the time. And that's because there are no gatekeepers and only the most panicked rise to the surface. This is not good news. No, I'd agree with you. I remember one time many years ago, my mother said to me, 
I was probably in my 30s. And she said, it's okay, you've got it. Other people don't have to know it. She didn't say that, but that's what I interpreted. It's enough to be able to do it, to carry that dignity. Looking up blue sky over me, there's soft grass teen my toe. Gentle spring wind blows and someone saying there's that face again. And I'd know that face anywhere and I know he'll be a friend to me. He won't hurt and treat me bad. He'll be the best friend I've ever had. People young and old saying please take hold of a hand that's icy cold. Teach my face to look bold and give me reason to live again. And give my face a soft warm smile, talk and be my friend a while. They need, well, a friend who's strong and true. They feel that there's nothing they can do to change the bad times. Oh. And rearrange the bad mind, baby And mix with all kinds of people, whoa Hey, friends, who be kind like me Cause I don't really mind where you're going or what When I saw you at Kerry Hall, you, you walked on stage you were just very present. That's one of the first things I noticed. You were very present, standing up very straight, just talking directly to us. I felt like you were talking directly to us. And I am talking directly yeah, to you. Which and I am is unusual. in a state of joy. If you don't like what I do, I'm not going to abuse you, and I'm not going to abuse myself. The only thing that's going to happen if you don't like me and my vision is that it's going to break my heart. Yeah. And that makes an audience so safe because then they can look at me and they'll, they'll go, Livingston, don't be sad. Huh. I love you. And you allow them to heal you. And when you do that, they go crazy. They huh. love that feeling. You know, not many people talk directly like, like that it can make people uncomfortable when you're when you're direct people don't know how to react to it and then it's kind of a realization that they are in a safe safe space they are absolutely safe in my presence so you you gig 70 to 80 times a year first off now, right? i don't gig let me be clear about that you perform i perform right. i do concerts i do appearances i don't refer to what i do and as who gig, i am yeah. as a gig it has a sharpness to it. It has a thrown off a phrase about it. And I just, I don't view myself that way. And I certainly don't view my music and who I am that way. But anyway, you perform like, uh, what, 70, 80 times a year, I saw? Yeah. No? About that. It must depend on where you are, I'm assuming. But tell me about that feeling a little more from sort of a week goes by or a, a month goes by. That feeling on stage of that connection. I'm always delighted to be in the presence of my audience. I'm more than delighted. I needed them. They did not need me. Mm. That they are there is not my problem. It's my salvation. They are saving my life. Their presence alone is saving my life, to say nothing of applause and buying CDs. Right, I mean, it. Right. Uh, I'll go to a show and I look for excuses to go out and just hang out in the front lobby, meet people coming in, shake hands. If there's a line at a club waiting to get in and see me, I love just working that whole line, walking the whole length. I pretend I have somebody to get in my car. And I just meet everybody. Yeah. And by the way... They're going to remember meet, that forever. They're going to yeah. remember that forever. And when they come into the show, and I've sold 300 tickets, and I meet 40 people, that means every one of the people I meet has a vested interest in my doing well. They are peppered through that audience, and they are going to look out 
for me because now they've bought stock in me. They own me lock, stock, and barrel, and they want that stock to go up. And if anybody messes with me, they will take them out. This isn't rocket science here, people. I can tell when the person on stage is vested in me as an audience, that when they, that they care about me. Yeah. And one of the things that really I've never had a teacher say this to me, and maybe they thought it, but one of the things I saw in the documentary is after you'd give a little critique or you'd say this, you did this, great, this is awesome, and you'd say, and I love you, which must take, do the kids, does it take them back a little bit when you do that? Well, you know, I don't know. Because uh, it's, but it's, it's a true, beautiful like, thing that you yeah, say. I think it's, yeah. a, it's an amazing thing that they probably never yeah. hear ever or, or very seldomly. But, but I, tell, I tell audiences all the time that I, that I love them. I love you guys. And it's true. People like to be loved. They like to think that they matter that they have value. My brother James was playing at Barack Obama's inaugural event, Mm -hmm. second inauguration, and he did America the Beautiful, and I think Beyonce did Star Spangled Banner. I remember it. James played live, Beyonce taped, and I thought to myself, here is the second term of the first president of color my brother James had worked very hard for Barack Obama's re-election, carried a lot of water. And the idea for my brother that here are these close to a million people out there and endless more on television. This is why he made music, was so he, it would be in this moment. Now, was he terrific? No. His notes were shaky. There was some miscord. Who cares? Nobody cares. And I, I looked at Beyonce. And I thought to myself, later in your life, young lady, you will be sorry that you didn't sing Mm. to the moment and in the moment. And she had done some $40 million deal with PepsiCo and somebody would have advised her not to take a risk with her brand or whatever they would have said. And you just go, oh, go away. I'm so tired of it. Be in that moment. This is what you worked for for a lifetime. Be in it. It'll be fine. Well, it reminds me of that story you told when you opened up for Jethro Tull. The audience got unruly and threw a beer bottle. And you said, this is too important for me to continue. You you made (laughs) that moment uh, The reason why I couldn't continue is that my presence was putting this audience in danger. Right. I couldn't do that in spite of the fact that I didn't like them very much. It is also possible to love an audience and not like them very much. <laughs> yeah, right. Occasionally, I'll be playing for a corporate event or something. I'm part of a gift bag, basically. Yeah. Nobody will be paying any attention, at which point I don't take my music to them. What I do is I'll play my music and I'll play it right to here, right. to an imaginary spot on huh. the floor. And I'll huh. say, if you want it, come and pick it up here. I'm not going to bring it to you because your behavior pattern will make me feel poorly about myself and about who I am. So I'm not going to come to you, and I'm not going to try to come to you. If you would like this, it'll be here, available for pickup at your leisure. (laughs) But um, I'm I'm not going to serve it to you. I'm not going to bring it to you. Right. You're making it something more important than just you trying to make a name for yourself. You're not. It's not about. I mean, this is a big opportunity for you in front of the. Was it Madison Square Garden? Right. Yeah. I don't know anyone else who would actually stop and say, you know what, this isn't the right moment. Well, I didn't say it that way. I just said, I I stopped my guitar and and I said, it will not be possible to continue this evening. And I left. That was that. I think it's significant because it just shows you how important these moments are. Yeah. And whether or not it's a successful moment because you got huge F yeah. doing Madison Square Garden, it kind of transcended but the, but that. But all, also, all of that, get huge. Yeah. What does that mean? I am continually bemused by the people who would come to me and compare my career with that of my beautiful brother James Mm -hmm. and that somehow I got the short straw. Somehow the fates were good to him and cruel to me. And I just, no, no, this has worked out unbelievably well. (laughs) This is, I love my career. I love what I've been able to do. I love James's career. 
He didn't steal it from me. He yeah. didn't get that career and I got second place. Yeah. No, I got an unbelievable life and career. There's a show you did in the mid 80s. I know I'm skipping around. This Week in Music or This, this Week's music. This Week's apostrophe S weeks, music. Yeah, music. Uh, it was a show that was modeled after a successful show of the time called Solid Gold. Right. And it was sort I used of. to watch that. I was asked to host the show by a, a guy named Charlie Koppelman, who's a, a real advocate of mine. And uh, we did this show and it lasted for 13 weeks and then folded. It didn't make enough oh, money. Okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, came and went. And yeah. You know, when I read about that in your wiki page, it was kind of, I wanted to know your how that experience was for you to actually well, I change think it was, the Well, I think seat. that it was all right. It was, it was in 84, and I was in my 30s. Yeah. And the 30s, uh, as you will remember, are a terrible decade. <laughs> um, the problem with the 30s is that when you're in your 30s, you're old enough to have a mortgage and a uh, make a couple of kids and the sense is that you really know something and that you ought to be put reasonably in charge the problem is that in your 30s you really don't know anything number one and the people who are in charge who are in their uh, 60s and 70s once they get into their 70s they're going to turn it over to somebody else mm -hmm. but it's not going to be a 30 year old it's going to be a 40 year old mm -hmm. so you get through your 30s then you get into your 40s and somebody starts actually handing you the world as you will remember yeah and they actually give you actually We're give trying. you real <laughs> responsibility yeah and which point you go oh my god i don't know anything about anything because now it's really on your shoulders right you and thought you knew you thought you knew and now <laughs> you start learning now you start drinking up information now you call those older friends of yours go I, what do i do listen they just gave me this thing and i have no clue i am petrified and you you're going to be fine just keep this in mind they gave it to you for a reason they figured you were ready. And then you do learn how to do it. But it drives me crazy when my fellow teachers say kids don't know anything. Well, of course they don't know anything. That's why they're in college, is to learn something. Don't worry, we didn't know anything then either. either. Yeah. The problem with your 30s is that you don't know what you don't know. And when they actually give you responsibility, the panic sets in. Now you start learning. I totally get that. Yeah. Every year I get older, I feel dumber. Yeah. Because I realize how, I, I just oh I don't know that. Oh, I also don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that either. And by the way, you look smarter, what you though. what you really realize is the absolute unfathomable depth of our ignorance. Yeah. It's stunning. I love Thomas Edison's phrase on this. Thomas Edison, doubtless in a fit of pique, cried, "We don't know one tenth." of 1% of anything. <laughs> and that's, that's, probably, that's probably that's probably generous. Yeah. And that's probably generous. Yeah. And that's coming from Thomas Edison. Well, you know, I just went to the uh, this Old South Meeting House and it was a event sponsored by the Mass Historical Society. It's been 100 years since the molasses flood. Yes, the Great Molasses the Great uh, Molasses flood, flood, which I was probably one of the younger guys there because probably everyone being younger than me thinks they know everything and everyone above me knows that I don't know anything. So they were all there. But uh, it was fascinating. I really enjoyed it. As I realized I don't know anything and I'm going back to school now. No, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. it's, and by the way, I get ferocious about my studying and yeah, about I'm, I'm how feeling things that more are. That yeah. I get older. I don't know I, what it is. A couple of years ago, I, I was troubling over global warming and nuclear proliferation. Mm. And if you're concerned about global warming and nuclear proliferation, ultimately, it takes you to nuclear fission yeah. and whether nuclear fission is a reasonable thing to use to replace coal, sure. hydrocarbons right. as energy producer. And Seems what I reasonable. realized yeah. is that I just didn't know anything about it. And so I started studying about nuclear fusion and fission and where it comes from. And somebody says, well, these radioactive wastes are dangerous. Well, what does that mean? What does dangerous 
mean? What does it mean to be hit by alpha rays or beta or gamma? What are alpha, beta, gamma rays? How many of them takes to hurt you? Mm -hmm. Why do you get hurt by them? What's happening? What does it mean when you ionize uh, cells in your body? Mm -hmm. And why don't they work? when? You... So there are just a billion yes. questions. questions yeah. And if you want to actually be part of of a solution or have some something to contribute, you just simply have to study your butt off. Mm. Other than that, you're just another spouting old guy. We started this conversation with the kids in Berkeley. You know, I, I think that what's different these days, too, is you have to study and you have to learn about all these topics to know what you're talking about and to, and, to grow. And I but it's so easy to to just Google. The Googles, well, I was driving over here and I was thinking about steel production. Mm -hmm. And I had forgotten when George Bessemer invented the Bessemer converter. And the answer is, by the way, 1858. Mm -hmm. And the Bessemer converter was one of these things that absolutely transformed the human experience. Because now you could make steel in unending quantities. Mm. All that we see around us is the result of the Bessemer converter and transitioning to steel is the fundamental building block of civilization. All those tall buildings, they are all Bessemer converter. And again, how it works and how you make iron and what you put in it and how you strengthen it. And, and Google is great for all of that. By the way, Andrew Carnegie brought that technology to Pittsburgh Mm, that's where that happened. That's, and yeah. the rest is history. Well, you yeah. know, it's interesting because like, yeah. I have to read a lot now for class. And it's, it's not a muscle I've used a lot recently. It's, I need instant little bi bites. And now I have to read a whole freaking book. Yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's getting a little easier as I start reading more and more. But it's, it's something that, I mean, I try to get my kids to read all the time. And it's like pulling teeth. It's like, it's not easy because they got the computer right there and they can just look it up quick. Yeah. By the way, a thought that came into my brain, and I think about this with my students, what is the prime directive of life? What must all life do? What is the single job that all life has? And the answer is to reproduce successfully. It does not have to be bright. It does not have to be smart. And as I'm fond of saying to my students, you can lead a perfectly, you can fulfill the prime directive at a level of compromise and marginality that almost defies description. <laughs> I'm not interested. What I'm interested is for you, people who have had a inkling that they might live life as a creator and thinking that you might be able to fly that close to the sun and survive, that you might be able to live as one of the gods. And creators are treated like gods. And that you had the notion that you might be able to do this and were willing to go for it, I'm telling you, that's great. But when it comes to what should people do, they don't have to do this stuff. Your don't kids do don't have to read. It upsets yeah. you, but it, uh, that, uh, that, upset that them. they're dumb as a post it doesn't <laughs> upset them. No, it, doesn't. it upsets you because you want them to go for this higher ground that you understand is so exciting. But that's not their job. That was your job for them. And again, I don't have children, so I watch mm. other people have children and how they and behave. Drop them off. Uh, yeah. And they <laughs> drop them off with me. And I, uh, and it is. It's Uncle uh, Liv time. I'm not Uncle. It's no. Professor Prof Taylor <laughs> time. You have your 50 yes. years compilation. Yes. Going. 50 years, 5 0. Yeah? Yes. Excited? I'm delighted with it. I'm delighted to have walked a trail and now get a moment just to put a stake beside that trail, yeah. and then we'll keep walking. But yes, I am excited to consolidate 50 years of live performing in this. It's all live. Remember, a life well lived is boring. I say this to my students all the time, do not live the life that people are going to be interested in. Don't you be the story. Let your songs be the story. Be mindful about the difference between attracting attention 
and commanding attention. When you are young and you have no skill set, the best you can do is attract attention. The problem with attracting attention is that you can't turn it off. It's like taking off your shirt. It's like taking off your shirt. Yeah, no, my students love the idea of commanding attention. Hmm. And I just explained it takes time to be able to to do do that. It's hard to do because you have to be really competent. And that takes lots of discipline. And years. And that goes along with being interested. Yeah, interested. What can I see? I live outside of Boston. I like living there. I have a house and... I have a garden behind my house. I made, a, made it round last year. Big round garden. I don't know why I made it round, but it looks very nice. I got a rototiller, though, and it's very difficult to steer it when you get close up to the edge. So my suggestion to you, if you ever make a garden, is don't make it round. If you're using a rototiller. Thank you very much for this. I hate, I can't turn a whole garden without a rototiller. Because maybe I'd get Rufus to do it. Mm. I don't think so. Well, at any rate, I'm getting off my story. I was mulching my potatoes one time last summer. And I was singing a little song, just enjoying myself. And I looked over and, gosh, my chili peppers were swaying back and forth, digging the sounds. (laughs) Oh, no, I don't believe this. I tried another song. The chili peppers didn't care much for it, but the... Cukes went crazy. <laughs> All right, I'll be. Um, try this tune or that tune. Sometimes the cukes would love it. The tomatoes would think it was awful. Chili peppers would think it was great. Corn says, mm, nix. Well, I was looking for that one song that everything in the garden loved. Well, I hit on this tune here. Every vegetable in my garden loves it. Except for the broccoli. But I suspect they secretly liked it. Just didn't want to let on. Sitting with me all about the things I see. Called on the board, meat and friends for salad and beef. You go so I don't know what you hope to find. So to back, get a thought back in an easy time. Morning to your neighbor, is your labor worthwhile? Would you stop it for a moment and smile? Do your wife or do your lawn, but do you be long? If you want to stop a plunder, your life will be gone. Over to my left, a deep blue sea. A woman on my right, looking so tasty. You go so I don't know what you hope to find. Sit you back and get a thought back in an easy time. What do you think you see? Stand up, oh, draw out your misery. Ooh, get together with me. Mm-hmm. Now, do's got you, don't you patch it up. Don't show that you don't recall who you are. Prove that it's so, but no one's getting close to getting what you know. I've been sitting in the heat of a summer sun, fanning, tanning, panning out what everyone's done. The people around me love being kind to you back and get a thought back in an easy time. Yeah, yeah. Livingston is such a wonderful man, and we were honored to sit and talk with him. So thank you, Liv, and we love you. You can learn more about when he's playing next, his latest album, The Best of Liv, 50 Years of Livingston Taylor Live, and the upcoming box set, as well as see where to watch the great documentary, Livingston Taylor Life is Good, at livingstontaylor.com. To hear more great conversations, please go to abovethebasement.com, where you can join us on Patreon, sign up for our newsletter, 
newsletter, listen and subscribe to our podcast, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and look at all the nice pictures we post on Instagram. We are everywhere. On behalf of Ronnie and myself, thanks for listening. Tell your friends. And remember, Boston music, like its history, is unique. Hey, it's Chuck again. We would like to take a quick second to appeal to you to subscribe to this podcast above the basement. There are many really good reasons to subscribe, but I'll tell you just two of them. You never have to check to see if we have new episodes as they are automatically listed on your podcast app and it doesn't cost you anything. Just go to abovethebasement.com forward slash subscribe where we have links to all the major podcast apps, including iTunes, Stitcher, Radio Public, and more. There are instructions there on how to subscribe or you can just click on one of the subscribe buttons. If you already have a podcast app on your phone, for the most part, you can just open the app and you will see a magnifying glass on the interface. Just tap on that and type above the basement. You should see us right at the top. Just tap on the subscribe button and you are done. And while you are there, please write us a nice review. Subscribes and reviews in the podcast universe are an important piece to reaching more listeners. So please take 15 to 20 seconds and help spread the word about ATB. Thank you for your support. 